All right, so let's talk about Islam's influence and then the separate thing, which is the fall of Ghana. So these two things real quick. Part of this we covered in our last chapter. So Ghana, what happens to them around the year the 900s or so, there starts to be more and more Islamic influence in what we could call the royal court. That would be the area like around the emperor. People of West Africa are pretty smart. They realize that the Muslims who come in bring in a written language. They bring in Arabic, which is very good for keeping track of things as you have a growing empire now. It's no longer small villages. It's a growing empire. You can write down everything in Arabic and keep track of records. You can keep track of the trade, the gold trade, if you have more written records, which again are in Arabic. But these people who can write and read in Arabic, they also bring their religion, which is Islam. So what happens is in Ghana, many of the people who start to learn how to read and write Arabic slowly start converting to Islam, which makes sense. For some of them, I'm sure they did it because they could more easily trade if they were Muslims and had the same religion. I'm sure there's some people who did that. And I'm also there's, sure there's some people who like the faith a lot and wanted to become a Muslim. I'm sure there's both. But what does happen is Islam gets more and more influence in Ghana and in West Africa. And we start seeing a synthesis or a diffusion, a mix between the West African religion of animism and Islam. And in the royal court, more and more of the advisors to the Ghana or the king are Muslims. And slowly over time, what happens is the Ghana, the king, converts and becomes a Muslim. As much power as the Ghana or the king has in the empire, you can see he has a ton of power. If he tells the people to become Muslim, are many of them going to do it? Yeah. So when he converts, pretty much most of the kingdom converts. But as we've read, it doesn't mean that people give up their traditional practices. Many of them are now mixed into Islam. So some people are doing a mix of animism and Islam. We have some people who are all the way Muslims, not doing any more traditional practices. And there are some people who are all the way in the traditional side and aren't Muslims. And a whole bunch of people who are somewhere in the, in the middle. So that is how Islam comes into Ghana and becomes the religion of the empire by 1000 AD. So the last 76 years of Ghana's empire or so, the last 76 years or so, it is an Islamic kingdom. Like much of North Africa, Arabia, and a lot of the world at this time as we saw on the map that was becoming Islamic. All right, <clears throat> Ghana does start to decline, though. What happens is the kings can't control this monopoly forever. It's hard to control a monopoly because what happens when a gold mine gets discovered outside of the kingdom? Yeah, they'll want to take it over, but as more gold mines get discovered, what happens is people who are not in the Sonike or not in the Ghana Empire, they also want to trade with these North Africans. And they know if they charge like maybe a little less tax, that where are the North Africans going to go? They'll trade with them. So we start seeing this kind of like smuggling start happening. Some people realize that since there's a high tax here, they can smuggle. New gold mines are discovered by other people. So there becomes competition for trade. And over time, Ghana loses its monopoly. They no longer have complete control over the gold trade because outside groups are able to trade with these North Africans who are coming in with salt and other products. And they start losing some of their money that they were getting from taxes. So slowly over time, the king becomes less powerful and the kingdom starts to divide a little bit. We see what we saw happen with the um, uh, Zhou Dynasty in China, which led to a period of warring states where it breaks up. Now, there's two theories of what happened. 
There's two theories of what happened. One theory is that outside groups traded more and more with the North Africans, but Ghana, or the king, lost his power, and eventually the kingdom kind of crumbled from within and broke into a period of warring states. As more and more people, even in the kingdom, were smuggling or trading gold with North Africans. Does this make sense? As the king loses his power, more people trade with North Africans on their own, king doesn't get his taxes, and he starts losing money and power. That's one possibility of how Ghana fell. And then eventually it became a period of warring states, and there was no more empire over time. Another theory that we learned about last chapter is that the Almoravids came in and were able to take over the kingdom of Ghana in 1076. This is based on records that were written in Arabic in North Africa and Arabia. Some historians believe the Almoravids came in and took over Ghana. Some do not. Also at this time, there was a drought, which meant there was less rain, less food for the people, which also hurt the kingdom and made them weaker. So we see an environmental reason, a drought. We see new gold mines are established, and they have a tough time controlling them. And it's also possible there was an outside invasion. It's very possible the Almoravids came and saw, hey, the kingdom's getting weaker. How about instead of trading with them, we, we steal. We come in, we loot, and we take it. Because you'll trade with someone unless you can steal and take them over. Does that make sense? All right. So let's stop right there.